case you ever wonder why I take my glasses off, I can read better with them in this light than these glasses <laughs> than uh, with them on. I can't see you as well though, so you're free to, yeah, if, but just don't sleep, you might make too much noise. Um, but you can frown, I probably won't even notice it if you're frowning, sorry. Um, well, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to be able to share some things uh, that, that I've been thinking about from the, wor the Word of God. But I must confess, it, it's not always a, a pleasure preparing. It's, it's, it's troublesome for me. I, I feel like, gosh, I'm, I'm going to be trying to share some of God's Word. God, the creator of the universe that spoke everything that we see into existence. He's given us His Word. And here we are mulling it over, trying to understand it and work with it. Who am I to do that? Well, nobody, really. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you've put before us and the creation around us. And, uh, and even most importantly, through what we see among each other. Uh, you've told us that we're to love one another and that we're made in your image. And we just thank you for that. And we thank you for companionship, for fellowship. We pray that you be with us even now that your spirit would fill us and help us understand what it is you have to say. Uh, Lord, anything that I might share uh, that's not in accordance with what you want, then I pray it quickly be forgotten. Anything that might be helpful, please, Lord, help that to be used. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Um, <clears throat> before I even get started here, I just have to share with you something that's really cool. You know, we have these um, prayer uh, uh, leaflets, I guess you call them, in our bulletin, right? By the way, I'd encourage you to use those. Not, they're not being used a whole lot because we haven't been emphasizing it, but we're not doing corporate prayer here in the service uh, recently. So if you have a prayer request, feel, please fill this out and stick it in the offering plate that's in the back there uh, on your way out or any other time. And the elders at least will try to pick it up and work with it and maybe pass it on to someone else. You'll see it, it's self-explanatory. Sometimes it's private, sometimes it's not. This one, though, I just have to share with you. It's okay to share. I've checked. <laughs> and uh, it's from a young man in our church. And uh, he writes these more or less to the elders, and it's really encouraging. So I thank him for doing that for the elders. This particular one is pretty neat. It says um, on the first part here for prayer requests, pray that the missionaries of the world to be doing, to be doing good with their lives uh, and their missions and for all y'all to be blessed, he says. So that's kind of neat. But what's really cool is what's on the backside. <clears throat> so there's a place for others, other stuff here. And here's what he said. Remember two weeks ago, uh, Russ Brown uh, shared with us from, from the pulpit here. And uh, so here's what he said about Russ's message. And he prays, or he's asking, <clears throat> asks for Mr. Russ to, be, to, to preach more. He's a good guy. And he really high-spirited and funny. So I don't know how, I, how we follow that. But uh, that was just really cool. To me, it's a real, just, it's a, it gives me the warm, fuzzy feeling. We're a family, and it's neat to see family interacting like that. So thanks for being high spirit and a funny guy, Russ. We appreciate that. And uh, thanks, young man, for, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but thank you, young man, for, for putting that, giving that to us. That's actually going to tie in with the message here much, much later. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going <coughs> to attempt to just basically uh, hitch on to Ken's message from last week. You remember he spoke from Philippians 3. And I'd like to start off just to remind us what Philippians is all about. But first of all, Philippians 3, he's, he, the message I got from Ken last week, primarily, for me at least, was uh, to strive for the prize that is the upward call of God in Christ. And that's a relationship with Christ and with God the Father and the Spirit has uh, kind of wrapped up in going to heaven as well, but here as well, I think. So striving for the prize. Remember talking? he talked about a marathon, preparing for it and all that. It was working for that, which is what we do. After we're saved by grace, we work to be sanctified and be more like him. So Paul was writing to the Philippians, though. It's a letter from Paul. Uh, it was when he was in home arrest in Rome. It was written about, uh, uh, I think, 27 years after Christ had died and rose again. And it was written to Christians in Philippi, uh, the city that's now in the northeast corner of Greece. It's just barely in Greece, if you go look it up. But it's there. Um, and he wrote it to, there's actually many Romans there. <clears throat> and there were many Roman soldier, uh, retired Roman soldiers there. When I read that, it kind of reminded me of here. We have a lot of retired military guys here. We used to have a couple SEALs that lived on our neighborhood uh, years ago. So uh, you kind of put yourself in that context. You can imagine now the Christian group, the church that he's writing to. There were some Jews there too as well, but he doesn't write a whole lot with the Old Testament here because there weren't that many Jews apparently. Um, in, so in Philippians, you don't see much reference, if any, if any to the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> 
So I want to move on now to chapter 4. So Ken, Ken worked with uh, Philippians 3. I'm going to be in chapter 4. And that's how to strive or progress in that upward call. So we were said strive for it. Now Paul's going to tell us at least some things that we could do to be doing that. So I'm going to read now from uh, Philippians 4. I'm going to be in, in Philippians 4 pretty much the whole time. I'm going to jump back and forth. So if you want to turn there, uh, please do. But um, I wouldn't bother trying to track me with the other spots. Uh, it might slow us down too much or slow you down too much. But here we go. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 1. This is right after Paul has been talking about striving. And he talks about why this, you would strive because of the greatness, the goodness that we have in a relationship with Christ. And then he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, so stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I don't know about you, but we were just told, Paul just told us to move out, to, to strive, right? And now he told us to stand firm. To me, that's a little confusing, but it's not when you work your way through it. Uh, there's another place in Scripture that was even more confusing for me, but the same kind of idea. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. <laughs> when I first started reading, I was like, wait a minute, stand firm and then give yourself fully. What am I doing? Am I standing still and, and protecting or am I moving out and doing something? You know, well, it's both really. So what are we standing firm in? Um, uh, how do we strive and stand firm at the same time? What does that look like? Um, the best way for me to try to explain the way I've come to grips with this anyway is um, just through example. Imagine yourself in a conversation <clears throat> with perhaps a new acquaintance, new acquaintance, you don't know them very well, and uh, you're getting onto a topic. Maybe it bumps into something which is a little bit charged. Like a good example would be a, a, a march for life or a, a march for uh, choice, as they call it, right? Um, and so maybe there's, maybe there's more than one person in this conversation, and the conversation is going in a direction <laughs> that is not where you would normally go. It's going toward the choice thing. We're not talking about life. We're talking about choice. Um, you're a Christian. You have convictions, and you're standing that. You're part of that conversation, and now you, now you have a choice. <laughs> you have a choice as a Christian. Uh, are you going to stand firm in your faith, or are you going to blend in? If you're going to stand firm in your faith, you then are going to do something, probably. You're going to start pointing out why we believe in life uh, at conception and so on. So now you're moving out, aren't you? You're standing firm in your faith. You're going to risk your relationship with these people, but you're going to move out. You're, you're moving out with the truth. So when you put those two things together, <clears throat> it starts, I don't know, it's empowering somehow. I'm standing firm in my convictions. I'm standing firm in my beliefs, but I'm moving out. I'm going to give myself fully to the work of the Lord. So uh, that's Philippians 4.1. <clears throat> now we'll move on to um, uh, just right on down through Philippians here. I'm going to go now to Philippians 4, 2, and 3. I'd call this building unity, uh, if I was to summarize it. I urge Yodia and uh, I urge Sanctiki to live in harmony in the Lord. Remember, he's writing this to the church. That he's in prison. He's writing this church back in Philippi. And so he's saying, I urge uh, to them to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So build unity. This is one of those places where it's interesting. You know, the Bible's a real book about real people, isn't it? And so it's not sugar-coated here. This is real life. This is... Now, you think about what's going on between these two ladies. I don't think it's just disagreement. It must be divisive. And I've read some commentaries that talk about that. It's, it was probably divisive. And this must be really important because Paul calls them out by name. Think about that. He's writing a letter from a distant, distant place, and, uh, but he's heard this news, and he's worried enough about it or concerned enough about it. He's concerned enough about it that he calls them out by name. But he doesn't leave it up just to them. Notice what he says next. It's a community project. He, he wants everybody to help to resolve this conflict. He wants everyone to help resolve this disharmony. So it's a community project to restore harmony. And this is among believers, isn't it? Because remember he says here, uh, fellow workers. <clears throat> so if we are all, if we are united, united in Christ, we should be workers for Christ, of course. But if we are fellow believers, we should be in community with one another. Seems to be. 
And we should be working together. If we see disharmony beginning to show up someplace, it could be a minor thing, usually is a very minor thing. We should be working to try to head that disharmony off at the pass. That's, that's what we're called to do here. It's very interesting. When you start uh, just becoming aware of this whole concept of unity among believers, man, it is all through the scriptures. We're going to hit it a couple more times before we're done today. But here in Philippians 4, 2, and 3, um, Paul is calling on a community to help with this disharmony and to restore harmony. In fact, I'll just mention it now. Jesus spoke of the importance of this in the Sermon on the Mount. Let me just turn there now. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, if I can find it here. Here we go. Uh, this is Matthew 5, uh, and it's chapter 23 and 24. You'll remember hearing this before, but this kind of underscores. By the way, it's interesting, studying these chapters in Philippians, <clears throat> I'm realizing, you know, this is what Paul is writing to the, the church in Philippi. But then it's kind of neat to, to track a little bit, and you can see, well, yeah, that makes sense. Jesus said that. You know, and Paul's re basically re repeating it, much like I'm repeating it now. Um, so on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, <clears throat> If therefore you are, in, uh, you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be con reconciled to your brother, and then <clears throat> come and present your offering. Man, think about that a minute. Just, <laughs> I just get, I just get uh, uh, blown away every time I think about this. And you've heard me say it before. First commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's what Jesus said when they asked him. God said the greatest commandment is love, he, love him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like unto it, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. So that's kind of a start. That's like bedrock. Love God, love each other. That's what Jesus said. Now, in the verse I just read, think about it. He says, if you're going to give an offering to me and you have a problem with your brother, stop. Go resolve the matter with your brother first and then come to me. I drew a little schematic, which I'm not sharing with you right now, but it's really fascinating to me that the most important thing, our relationship with God, in a way, is controlled by our relationship with each other, is it not? Because he tells us, don't offer something to me until you've got it squared away with your brothers, if there's something wrong with your brothers. This reflects to me, almost word for word in a way, what he taught the disciples in the Lord's Prayer. Remember? Uh, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Same principle. Same principle. It's important. It's very important. If we want to have what's coming next. And what's coming next is uh, Philippians 4, 4 through 7. <clears throat> so let me go there. Back to there. This is, this is the part we like so much, most of us. It says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I always like that, even though I struggle sometimes with trying to pray and have worry go away immediately. Uh, still, it's a great, great passage, and it, it's a great comfort many times. So just to walk through it a little bit here, uh, I, I was reading that uh, the word joy is actually interchangeable with celebration in the ancient application of joy. So when we're told to rejoice, we're actually told to, like, celebrate. Celebrate your relationship with God. Um, and if we think about that for a minute, why would we do that if we're anxious about stuff? Well, just stop and think about, I'm saved by grace. I am a child of God. That's a celebration. We fall back on that and remember, uh, as we get started going through the uh, prayers for getting rid of anxiety, the first place is rejoice, he tells us. Rejoice. And then uh, he says, be anxious in nothing. Well, you know, there's plenty of reasons to be anxious these days, aren't there, I think. And I'm not going to go there. We all know probably things popping in your head right now. There's plenty of things to, uh, to be worried about. Some of them are personal. Some of them uh, may be statewide. Some of them may be national. Some of them may be worldwide. Uh, but there's plenty to be anxious about. We don't need to, to dwell on that too much. Before I go on, I might mention, though, that uh, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. I think that's interesting. 
when I think about the Lord being near, the first context for me that comes up, oh, that's great. He's, he's helping me, which he is. But also, he is near, and he's watching me too. You know? So he's watching to see if I'm obedient. He's watching to see if I'm going to lean on him the way he wants me to, or if I'm going to try to solve problems on my own. So he's near. That's a comfort. That's a great comfort. Um, so then uh, the, another thing I read that I thought was really interesting about this was, said, uh, this is, I think this is maybe the most important thing I'll say today because it keeps coming back to my mind. He says, if you catch yourself, this was a guy named Tony Evans where I pulled some of this material. Um, if, uh, uh, if you catch yourself beginning to worry about something, immediately think about that as a call to prayer. I think it's pretty cool. I feel myself starting to worry. Usually we get into it before we know it. And, and all of a sudden, though, someplace along the way, we'll recognize, oh, man, I'm anxious. I'm worrying. Uh, as, soon as, you, as soon as that crosses your mind, I wish I wasn't worrying. It's a call to prayer. Go to prayer. Go to prayer. Um, and then what do we pray? And how do we pray? So I just recently, I, I went down and just kind of, it's not a very thorough study, but I kind of was just curious, well, how did Jesus pray? And what, is, what does that look like? And so there's a, a, a number of references to that, of course. But you know what's not in there? I, I couldn't find anywhere. Somebody correct me later if I miss it. But I didn't find anywhere where Jesus was praying for somebody's infected toenail, for example. You know? uh, not to diminish that. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the types of things that Jesus prayed about were, um, uh, let's see, Unity, there it is again. If you watch, you go look, you'll see Jesus, that's important. He's talking about unity among believers and with him. So he prays about unity, he prays about thanksgiving. Then he actually prays about escape when he was about to be crucified. You remember, Father, for, Father, let this cup go somewhere else. I don't want to, I don't want to do this. But he also prays for the God to be glorified, but Lord, let your will be done. Father, let your will be done. And then he also prays, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and kind of surrender, well, not, it is surrender. Uh, into your hands I give my spirit. Remember that when he was about to die. So he's, he's paying, praying about big stuff. Now, we don't know what he was praying about when he went off in the, in the, uh, to, on himself, by himself in the mornings and the evenings. That's not recorded in, that I know of. But um, maybe then he was going down more of a list of things for his disciples and so on uh, and other, other things. Um, so uh, we're supposed to pray. And what does that do? That causes us to look to God, not our problems. Um, and I'm a sailing guy, so I have to go to the example that always comes to mind when, uh, when I think about this. You'll remember it well, I think. This is uh, Matthew 14, uh, 22 and 23. If I can find that one. Here we go. So I'll just read this. <clears throat> You'll remember it well, I think. And immediately he made the disciples, this is Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. While he sent the multitudes away and after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain to pray by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone, but the boat was already many stadia away. That's about half a mile, I think, from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him they, on the sea, they were frightened, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat. It's amazing to think about. Got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, and took hold of him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? <clears throat> Excuse me. And when, and when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. You know, I read that. This, you've, you've heard that story many times before. What really strikes me, first of all, is, of course, and uh, we've heard this before, too, that... Um, when he saw the, first he saw Jesus and when he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on the water just like Jesus did. But when he took his eyes off Jesus and saw the wind, and I'm sure we don't see wind, he saw the effect of the wind, probably the waves as much as anything, the storm. And uh, when he was focused on that, oh my gosh, and, uh, and, he, and he began to sink. 
So that's the first thing that comes to mind, is keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on God. Keep our eyes on the Father, the Spirit. Um, but Jesus is the one that came and showed himself to us, so he's probably the one we should be thinking about primarily. But another thing came to mind as I read this, particularly after hearing Ken's message last week. Remember when he said, lay hold of what Christ has given me? First of all, Christ laid, uh, Christ laid hold of me first, Paul said last week. And then uh, after that, he said, and then I'm trying to lay hold of Christ in the same way, right? When he was reading those things to me, I, re I remember playing Sandlot football and how much I love to tackle guys, you know? <laughs> it's something really feels good, a good solid tackle just feels good, but that's like laying hold, hanging on. You grab them and you hang on tight. So that's what I thought about. And then when I read here that Jesus reached down and he grabbed him. You can imagine their arms intera interacting like that, interlocking like that. He grabbed him and he knew he was, he was okay. He was going to be okay. I'm sure he grabbed on too, you know, but he probably didn't even have to. Jesus had him and he was going to pull him back and get him into the boat, which he did. So that solid God's got me uh, feeling uh, image comes to mind when I picture uh, him sinking down in the water and Jesus grabbing him as he goes down, um, pulling him back in the boat. So uh, in this case, the miracle was ended. The miracle that is of walking on the water uh, was ended by a focus on the wind and the waves. And Jesus did take hold of him, as I just mentioned. So we need to hang on to Christ. And it's a solid grip. It's a solid grip. Let's move on. Uh, one more thing here. Uh, I mentioned talking about speaking, uh, praying about specific concerns. Excuse me. Um, and so uh, we are told to pray about all things and with thanksgiving. So um, sometimes I think we do use a list too much. Uh, we just go to God and we start asking for stuff right away. Um, maybe we should spend more time uh, adoring him and confessing and thanksgiving before we get to the supplication, the, the asking for stuff. Um, but he also says, just come, you know, come. I think, I think it's pretty clear. You know, you, you, you don't have to follow a formula. You go, you come talk to me anytime you need to, God says. Um, in fact, it reminded me of, uh, I call them silver bullet prayers. I've had a number of those over my years. Uh, the one that I think about that I've, I've shared with some of you before is during the Hurricane Michael, when our sliding glass doors were about to blow off the house and I'm watching them bow in unbelievable ways that engineering says they can't do. <laughs> uh, I, I prayed, and it wasn't a well-thought-out lofty prayer. It was, oh, God, please keep these doors on here. You know? So uh, that was a silver bullet prayer, I call it, you know, just bang, and uh, no, uh, nothing pretentious about that. And so uh, I, was I worried? Yeah, I was worried. I was very anxious. I was very worried, and, uh, and yet that's a prayer that, that went up, and I'm so glad that he honored that prayer, and the doors did stay on. And I didn't get blown out into the backyard as I expected to happen, or really the neighbor's backyard as I expected to happen. Um, well, let's move on a little further then into Philippians uh, 4, 4, 8, and 9. I, I might summarize this as uh, ponder the positive. Ponder the positive. Let's read this. Um, finally, brethren. So again, Paul writing to the Philippians. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. And the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace shall be with you. You know, this is really the reason I, I, used, I wanted to go here, this last part is the real reason I wanted to go here. Um, I, I bet there's at least some of you here who have been, had an experience very similar to mine. Maybe even most of us here have had an experience similar to mine. In recent days, meaning the last four or five years at least, um, uh, driven by a lot of junk that is not positive at all. A lot of junk that's not positive at all. Inside all that junk, sometimes there's nuggets of things that are useful to know, but quite frankly, most of it we don't need to know. We can't do anything about it anyway. Um, my personal experience in this regard, I'll get to in just a minute, but let me just say that this, these verses 8 and 9, when you think about it, uh, uh, we, we just went through um, how to get peace with God uh, and, and, and get rid of anxiety. Um, but if you're like me, it doesn't always hang around real long, does it? You, you get to a place where, oh, okay, I'm going to trust in God. I've prayed, I'm good to go, 
and then you walk down the street 10 minutes later and you're worrying about something again already. So it's easy to lose that sense of peace. Well, how's, how do we hang on to that sense of peace? Well, this is, this is how, uh, verses 8 and 9. Think on the good stuff now. Once you've turned yourself away from what was worrying you, you've thought about God, continue to dwell on good stuff. Try not to get caught up in the bad stuff. So help, it helps us to hold on to our peace. Um, it's interesting, Paul's example, because he mentions follow my example. Uh, remember his example? He's writing from uh, house imprisonment in Rome. I don't know about you, but when I hear house improvement, I, uh, house imprisonment, I think, oh, that's kind of cushy. You know? and it may have been a little bit, but we've just been through uh, a lot of um, uh, lockdowns, and you can't go everywhere you're supposed to. You want to, you got to stay home. Get a little bit of feel for what that might have been like. But with Paul, why was he in, in house arrest? If I'm not mistaken, he had to go see, he had to go to court, basically, and he, it wasn't optional. He was going to go to court, and the end result might be he's going to lose his life, right? He didn't know. So he had a lot uh, to be concerned about or worried about. Um, so he was under house arrest, but he wasn't worrying, apparently, not much anyway, because he was able to conduct business, if you will. He was, he was, he was ministering to others and doing what he could. Um, and so he wasn't, he wasn't uh, caught up and, and paralyzed by worry or anxiety. He was praising God. He was praising God as he was there and continuing to labor for the Lord. Um, and this is pretty cool, too, if you think about it. Uh, this last verse, and the God of peace shall be with you. So at first we're praying for the peace of God to come and help us. If we do that, Paul is saying, and we do other things that he's telling us, like think about good things. Then Paul says, the peace of God will be with us. So we get the presence of God as well. So we, had, we get the peace of God up front or in the middle. And then if, we, if we're consistent in that and we think about the, uh, the good things, we're going to get the presence of God. And uh, I would imagine most of you have had some experiences similar to some I've had where, man, you just know God's in the room or God's in the woods with you or God's in the boat with you or wherever it is. You just have a sense of his presence. And how cool is that? So these things help us get more of that presence of God in our lives. So then kind of the practical application. Um, oops, sorry, I jumped the gun. One more thing about that. Uh, when, I when I just suggested the presence of God in your life, he wanted him to be close to you. Again, if you're like me, there have been times in my life where I'm not sure I want that. I'm not sure I want that right now. Why? Because there's something <clears throat> inside me, in my thought life, in the, my word life, whatever it is, my attitude, something sinful. Something simple. It's not something that's going to make me lose my salvation, I think, from Scripture, best I understand. But it is something that can keep me stiff-arming God, more or less, you know. And so, why he might be willing to come and have a closer presence with me, I'm holding him off because I'm not, I, I, I don't, I, it makes me very uncomfortable. So, what happens if you feel like that? That's pretty clear from Scripture, isn't it? We all know. Confess. And repent and confess. God, I'm sorry about this thought I'm having or this thing I did or whatever. Is there anything I can do to make it right with anybody I might have offended? Um, or uh, is there something I need to do, God, with you? We know we're saved by grace, and so it's all about forgiveness. Jesus, our same Lord, says forgive 70 times 7. If he's asking us to do that, he's going to do it as well, I think. And I think it's pretty clear that as long as we come to him with a truly contrite heart, a repentant heart, we're asking for forgiveness, he'll forgive us. And then we can get back to that fellowship with him, which is so awesome. It's a solid feeling, right? You're not anxious now because you know you're secure. But if that sin is keeping us separate from our God, then we're insecure because we're not on that solid foundation. So I'd encourage you to also remind me if I'm down in the mouth someplace, remind me, hey, are you all, are you all pray, prayed up, John? You, you, you go, go check with God and see why, why uh, you're anxious. You know, We need to keep each other squared away. And then in real practical terms, this last thing I wanted to say, again, this is kind of why I focused on verses 8 and 9, really. Uh, I think they're an antidote for politically charged media. It's an antidote for politically charged media. It is not. Um, in my experience, you know, TV, radio, social media, all those things are, are feeding on, or I should say they feed us, they feed our appetite for dirty secrets, sensational stories, you know, in the old days, we used to say it sells papers, uh, and we, aren't, we don't do that much anymore. So now I don't know how exactly what they say, something like it racks up likes or something. I don't know. But um, 
I think we're stuck with this for probably forever. We have the, technic the technology to do it. Anything going on in the whole wide world, you know, within minutes, pretty much. We have the technology to do that now. Well, what are we using it for? Some good things, of course, but uh, people have this appetite for junk, and, uh, and they eat it up, and that makes money. And so people, that's what they sell to, basically, right? So the big tech, that's probably going to go on forever, I would suspect. Um, so it's up to us whether or not how much of that we use, how much of that we, that we use. For me, I'll just share with you what, something that, that I've done, a couple things I've done. Years ago, I realized that it was, it was uh, not doing me any good to listen to talk radio on the way into work in the morning, which I did for a while there, every morning. I couldn't wait, you know, next morning, dial it up and see what the latest news was. So I'd walk into work and already be in a sour mood, of course, right? So I just made up my mind, you know what? <clears throat> I do still want to hear that stuff, but I don't want to do it the first thing in the morning. I'm going to wait till after lunch. At least let me get a start on my day without worrying about all this stuff that I probably can't do much about anyway. And it just makes me mad. So I did that. Years ago, I did that. I couldn't wait to watch it at noon, though. You know? <laughs> uh, but another thing that happened then just recently, when, uh, when we lost our pastor and we elders had to step up some more, and I happened to be the, the, the guy kind of in the middle of that process, I suppose, um, I thought, you know, our church needs more than I've been given it for sure. And so I'm just going to do my best to virtually swear off all that stuff now. So I haven't been watching mainline media. I haven't been watching... Uh, the opposing uh, media haven't been listening to talk radio, uh, haven't been looking at um, uh, Facebook type stuff. Um, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, you know, again, 90% of that stuff we can't do anything about anyway. I used to tell myself, I'd argue to myself, I need to know this so I can be um, educated in my conversations with those around me and make sure I'm sharing my opinion with them. And there's some validity to that, I'm sure. Um, but man, it should not control us. Doggone it. It should not control us. So, um, I would just encourage you to turn it off. Look at something good, just like Paul's telling us in, in verses eight and nine. Uh, uh, don't concentrate on the stuff that's negative. Focus on the stuff that's positive, honorable stuff. Read a book about good character. Uh, you know, obviously the Bible is the place to start, but there's all kinds of other things you can do, uh, to focus on good things. Uh, spend time with people that have good character. Um, so read, uh, uh, do something, do something positive. Uh, read, read or watch or do something positive. Like go to the lot, go to the uh, go to the uh, chain today. <laughs> go to the uh, uh, what's it called, David? My life, life chain. Thank you. Go to the life chain today. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what I had. Just in closing, I'll just I'll just share with you the takeaways from all this. Stand firm in the Lord. Build unity, seek peace through prayer, ponder the positive. And then I want to essentially close, or almost close, just with a prayer. Uh, actually reading a prayer that Christ had, and uh, it's shared with us in Scripture here. Uh, this is um, almost at the end of the last, I guess it is really, at the end of the Last Supper. So Jesus is with his disciples and um uh, I mean, these are, this is pretty important stuff. This is the last he's going to see him as a, as in, in the form he's in at that time. Um, and he's, he's sharing very tenderly with them and in very, very uh, poignant uh, material here. It's a long, long prayer. This is the high priestly prayer, if you have a, annotated in your Bible someplace. It's in John 17. But I'm just going to do a few verses from it, verses 17 through uh, 21. And so, before I start, I might just remind us, He's talking about sanctifying here in, the, in our, my, this translation anyway. Jesus says, you ever wonder what, Jesus, what it sounded like when Jesus said it, though? It was a whole different language, right? He didn't say sanctify. He said whatever he said in, in, uh, in that language. And it might have been some other word altogether, but it means sanctify the best we understand. Now, what does that mean? What does sanctify mean? Set apart for God's purposes. Set apart for God's purposes. And if you think about set apart for God's purposes... It ties back once again to some stuff Ken was sharing. It's a relationship. You're set apart from the world for God's purposes. If you're doing God's purposes, you're closer to God than you would have been if you weren't. So it's tied in with you're closer to God. It's part of a relationship. And it's for his purposes. So you're doing something. Uh, you know, what are those things? Well, that's the life that we live as a Christian 
being sanctified, moving more into what he wants us to be. And as we do that, these are the things I was just reading about. Stand firm, build unity, seek peace, ponder positive. Those, those are just some of the things, of course, that we do as we strive for the prize, right? We strive for that closer relationship with God. So I, I wanted to harp on uh, sanctify for just a minute because you'll hear, of course, Jesus in this translation is using that word in this prayer. So he says to them, sanctify them in the truth. Oh, he's, by the way, he's speaking to the Father, and he's probably, as best I can understand, he's, he's now saying them is the disciples around him. He's, he's praying to, the, to, to his followers. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves may also be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. Is that cool or what? <laughs> He's praying for us. He's praying for us because we've believed because of what the word that came to us through these guys, right? And then that they may, they may all be one. There's unity. That they may all be one. There it is again, right before he parts. He's, he's reminding them. Or he's praying to the Father, let them be one. And why is that? Even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that thou also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. So unity, once again, um, Jesus is praying for. So you might be asking yourself as we close here, um, wow, wow. Uh, there was some practical stuff in there, John was saying, but then he jumped to this prayer with Jesus. Oh, my gosh, how can I do uh, things like that? Well, Jesus empowers us, of course. Um, but here's just an example of the kind of thing. Little things. <laughs> they can be very little things that can grow into big things. Sometimes they're big things. But I, I tend to focus on the little things. Um, just little things that make a difference and are doing what we just talked about. Stand firm, build unity, seek peace, and ponder the positive. Remember the um, uh, prayer note that I started off with <laughs> from one of our young men? Let me read that again and think about that now in the context of stand firm, build unity, seek peace, and ponder the positive. <clears throat> he, he says, he asked for prayer that the missionaries of the world uh, to be doing good with their lives and their missions and for all you all to be uh, blessed. And then he said, uh, for Mr. Russ, to preach, uh, to preach more. He's a good guy and really high-spirited and funny. Can you, can you see the building up and the unity, the family? Uh, uh, also standing firm in the faith because he's talking about missionaries and stuff like that. That's a young man, in our, a very young man in our church. But it's an example. Why can we not do things like that and even greater things? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you're a mighty and awesome and powerful God and able to do such great things. Um, we're in uh, tumultuous times, Lord, and uh, uh, help us to seek you, to think on good things, to find peace, to, to let your, sol your soldiers surround us and guard us uh, with your peace. Uh, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.